Hey, good morning, everyone. I'd like you once again, please, if you would turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, and we're going to be reading uh, from chapter 8, and we'll read from verse 13, and we'll read into chapter 9 uh, down to verse 4, and we're going to be, uh, appreciate, somebody just opened in prayer, but we're going to talk about this morning when prayer is too late, when it's too late to pray, and so that's uh, going to be our little discussion. Beginning in verse 13, yeah, of Ezekiel 8, it says this, He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me in the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east." Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury." Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar, and the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the, the cherub, uh, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side, and the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. So just to remind us, uh, sometimes good just to refresh ourselves where we're at. So uh, Ezekiel has been taken uh, in spirit uh, from his home uh, by the, the banks of the Kibar, uh, and he's been taken to Jerusalem by the Lord, and he's been shown the abominations that are going on in the very temple of God. And the reason is because he's given the explanation of why his glory is has to leave why the glory of god cannot stay there any longer and once the glory leaves then why judgment will fall on the city of jerusalem including the destruction of the temple so he's really being given the facts why this is why god can't stay anymore this is the reason and so he's given been given a glimpse as it were of the evil and we looked at some of it last week and uh, we want to just continue on because what we've seen is uh, that there's kind of a progression or perhaps a better word is regression. They're getting worse. And so, uh, for instance, we saw in chapter eight, verse six, he said, furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations. So the first mention of abomination of verse six. And yet it says again at the end of verse 6, he says, But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Uh, verse 9, he said to me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do. And now here we are in verse 13. He says unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Now what we could say is this, that, that sin by its very nature tends to 
get worse and worse. Uh, it talks about in the last days, men will wax worse and worse. And, and so evil tends to have this abounding principle. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't just kind of, well, I just do a little bit and I'll stop. Uh, it tends to uh, develop. And, and so we saw uh, here in the temple, um, he's going to keep some greater abominations, greater abominations, greater abominations. And so we're, we're seeing this the whole time. So we notice uh, verse 13, then, then he said to me, hast thou seen this, O son of man? And it seems like at each juncture, he, he's asking Ezekiel, now, have you paid attention? Did you see what I see? Uh, have you seen why I am so grieved with this nation? So did you see it? Uh, so he's asking, uh, did you see this? And then he says, O oh, son of man, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations uh, that they do. Uh, so again, that's verse 13. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And so here are these women. They're outside the gate, which is where the priests would come in. This is where the, the brazen altar was. And they're all outside the gate of the Lord's house toward the north. And there, there are women there, and they're weeping, it says, for Tammuz. And so we need to kind of learn, who is this Tammuz? Well, Tammuz... Uh, was uh, a pagan deity, a god of spring vegetation. And so uh, he was said uh, to have died in the fall and uh, revived after the scorching heat of summer. Uh, and uh, it's the same as the Greek god Adonis. And, and so uh, women joined Ishtar, in mourning a dead lover, that's the picture, in intense drought during June and July. And so, again, it's this idea of, uh, you know, he dies in, this, in, the, um, in the, uh, the, the fall, of uh, course, in the, in the intense heat, everything is, you know, kind of at its maximum, and then it's going to die. He died like that, and so uh, she mourned, and then apparently... Uh, the the legend is that he rose again in spring, just like uh, the vegetation comes back on the trees in the springtime. And so it was because of her mourning uh, that he came back to life. And so the women of Israel, of, of Judah, are joining her, <laughs> Ishtar, in mourning this dead lover, uh, hoping that once again spring vegetations will come after the everything dying in the fall, and so uh, by the way, it's interesting that uh, Tammuz uh, was both the husband and the brother of Ishtar, uh, according to this legend. So again, it's just even the very uh, kind of background of it is is wicked, and and so uh, what we could say is this, by the way, and I think it's important to say this, Satan is a great counterfeiter. And so even this weeping for Tammuz and all the rest of it, um, the worship of Tammuz, it, it has this notion of a, a perfect son born to a virgin mother and resurrected in the springtime. And again, you can just see how Satan is a master counterfeiter in everything that he does. And so it became associated with the fertility gods and sun worship and all of these things. And so this annual feast of, of Adonis or Tammuz, it was accompanied by great abominations and licentiousness. And so, uh, again, what it's saying is basically it's like a worship of nature uh, denying that God is the one who is the one who is behind all of creation and all the goodness that comes to us. Uh, and so it's an alternative to worshiping the true God, who is the one who brings springtime and harvest, summer and winter, all of these things. In fact, if you look at Acts 14, just a couple of references showing the fact that God is the one who does this, who is the provider. And to, to worship any other being in terms of uh, the the fertility of the earth and all this kind of stuff is just an abomination to God. And this is going on in the very temple. 
And so uh, Acts 14, 17, nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Who is the one that's doing this? It's God, the, the God of Scripture, the God of Revelation. But they have got their substitute here now in uh, Tammuz, James 1.17. Again, just a reminder that all the, the goodness that we have, he says, uh, verse 16, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So it's just good to remind ourselves and, and to be thankful that everything that comes to us that's a good gift, the food we enjoy, the rain that, rain, that, that waters the earth, everything comes from the hand of God. But here, Judah, who should have known better, and the women of Judah, who should have known better, they are weeping for Tammuz. Uh, they've bought into this pagan philosophy, uh, and that's what they're uh, displaying at the very gate of the house of God. And God is saying, can you see why I can't stay here any longer? I'm not going to share my glory with another. I'm not going to share my glory with Tammuz uh, or any of this. And so here's the women weeping for Tammuz. Now notice verse uh, back again in Ezekiel. And verse 15, Ezekiel 8, verse 15, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Again, did you did you get a did you get a glimpse of this? Are you taking note of this? Turn thee yet again, thou shalt see greater abominations than these. So this continual digression or digression into sin, this downward spiral continuing. And so it says in verse 16, He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. So again, we 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 see sun worship is now taking place. We've seen sensual worship. We've just seen a lot of different things in this little glimpse, but now sun worship. In the very temple area, the inner court of the Lord's house between the porch and the altar, a more sacred place where only the priests had access. This is where the priests were to do their service. That's why we believe these 25 men, it represents the 24 courses of the priests and the high priest. And so the, the whole priesthood is corrupted. Uh, how do we know, by the way, that this was the territory that belonged to the priests? Let's just go back, a little, or should we say forward to a minor prophet, Joel, in chapter 2, uh, the book of Joel, in chapter 2, and we'll notice in verse 17, Joel 2, 17, it says this, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? So the priest, the minister of the Lord, where is their realm of activity? It's between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare thy people. So now we're, we're brought to the very same location, uh, between the porch and the altar, very same language is used in verse 16. And we see 25 men, and we believe these are representative of the 24 courses of priests and the high priest. And they're turning their back on the temple, and instead they're worshiping the sun, S U N. It would be wonderful if it was the sun, S O N, but it's the sun, S U N. Uh, that that was created on day four of creation. They're worshiping the sun. And again, the tragedy of this is uh, these people should have known better. Uh, they, they had uh, a knowledge of the scriptures. And Psalm 19 is a witness to the glory of God, uh, which talks about the heavens declaring the glory of God. The sun was part of that, uh, th that purpose of the creation of these uh, these heavenly beings was so that God would be glorified. Uh, in fact, he goes on and talks about the sun specifically. 
uh, he, he talks about creation, verse 3, there's no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. It's universal. The message of creation goes across the globe. Their line has gone out, verse 4, through the, throughout all the earth. The words to the end of the world, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of the chamber, rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. And so he's talking about the the, the sun's movements from rising in the morning and going to its, its peak at the end of the day. This is displayed throughout the whole word, world so that it might glorify God who made it, the creator of it. But tragically... Uh, these men who were priests should have known better in in op you know kind of open to everyone to see anybody who comes up to the gate of the uh, of the house of the lord they can see these men and they can witness what they're doing and their back is turned on the temple and they're worshiping the sun and so this is an abomination to the lord and of course uh, when did that begin well Let's look again at Second Kings, and we'll see where this instigated this sun worship. Second Kings, and chapter twenty-one, and verse five, we read about wicked King Manasseh. Remember when Manasseh came to reign? He was a son of Hezekiah. He was so evil that God, at that point, decreed that God was going to destroy. Uh, Judah, uh, because of the wickedness of Manasseh. And so it all goes back there. And so verse 5 of, of 2 Kings 21, it says, And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. The host of heaven being the sun, moon, stars, all the rest of it. He built them in the very house of the Lord. Look over in 2 Kings 23 and verse 11 and 12. And this is, of course, Josiah and his revival. And you'll notice what he does. It says in verse 11, then he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son at the entering in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs and burned the chariots of the son with fire and the altars that were in the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from the from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. So uh, here's this kind of uh, description of the 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 chariot, the horses, and it's like they're bearing chariots of the sun was the idea. Uh, at the entrance of the very temple, they've got this abomination set up by Manasseh, and Josiah destroyed it all. But now here's Ezekiel taken back, and what's he seeing? It's back again. They Once again, they're worshiping the sun. And again, you can just see how incorrigible they are that you know there's reform, there's revival, and yet pretty soon they go back to their old ways, and it's back to business as usual. And so verse 17 and 18 give a fitting conclusion to what Ezekiel has just witnessed in the house of God. It says, Then he said to me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose so this is uh, this idea of putting the branch to the nose this is really taxed the ability of bible commentators they really struggle with this what does that literally mean putting the branch to the nose whatever its significance it, it does seem to be a gesture of contempt toward god if everything else wasn't enough it's kind of like uh turning your nose up at god it's it's kind of a real way of, of saying God, you, you, we don't care about you at all. The phrase, put the branch to their nose, is so obscure. Uh, Jewish commentators understand it to refer to some revolting and wicked rite, but they don't really know what it was. Uh, some ritual act in, in an idolatrous cult, uh, and very serious indeed. But no such ritual act is known 
among Semitic peoples. They haven't been able to find anything like that, although one commentator thinks that it goes back to the Egyptians. Uh, you Sometimes you will see uh, descriptions uh, or inscriptions of Egyptians with a branch under their nose, and um, uh, it's uh, the, the imitation of the Egyptian Ankh, A-N-K-H, a symbol of life, which is shown in carvings and held to the nose. So it may have been, again, connected with uh, plants that were sacred to Tammuz or some other god. The bottom line is this. Whatever it was, we could say this without hesitation. You cannot turn your nose up at God without there being direct consequences. Whatever this branch to the nose is, some people think it's the symbol, you know, where you kind of do that kind of thing and you you, you can just make your own decision uh, of what it is. But bottom line is, uh, it, was a, it was adding insult to injury, turning uh, this branch to their nose. Verse 18, it says, Therefore will I deal in fury, Mine eye sh my eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear. And so here we have, we said as our title of this section, it's, it's prayer is too late. And so God is going to send his fury. He's not going to spare. He's not going to pity. And even if they cry, in my ears with a loud voice, he says, yet will I not hear them. Now, that's one of the most frightening verses in the whole word of God, isn't it? When when God says, it doesn't matter anymore, you, you're so bad, you're so wicked, that even if you would cry out to me at this stage, it's too late. You've gone too far. It's a bridge too far. You've gone too far. The time for prayer was past. Now, are they warned of that in Scripture? Well, yes, they are. Let's go back to the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and, and Proverbs chapter 1, a, a really a remarkable Scripture, but this is where the, the nation have come uh, in their wickedness. Proverbs 1 and verse 24 through 28. It says this, because I have called and you refused. Has God called them? Yes, he's been using prophets to speak to them for a long time. I have called, you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have set at naught all my counsel, would not of my reproof. Also, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. When your fear cometh as a desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof, reproof so on and so forth. So in other words, there comes a point of no return. There comes a point where God has been speaking, God has been warning, God has been sending prophets, God has been, been bringing uh, things upon them that would get their attention, and yet they, they stubbornly refuse to listen to the voice of, of God for the, the knowledge, the wisdom that God is bringing them. They refuse to hear it, and God says, okay, enough's enough. And at this point, judgment is the only thing coming. And even if you cry at that point, I'm not going to listen. Which takes us nicely into chapter 9. And chapter 9 is about slaughter that is coming to the city of Jerusalem. Now, we're going to notice that it's a discriminatory judgment. There actually will be some that will be spared. We're going to see those that are going to be spared. They're going to have a mark upon them. And God will spare them from slaughter. But it's a tiny group. But the majority are going to perish. So the vision here is what we could say is symbolically predictive. Okay. In other words, the, the actual thing that Ezekiel is shown is not actually going to happen for another six to seven years. Uh, when it does happen... 
it will be the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, who are going to be God's instrument of bringing this judgment. But in symbol, he has been shown, as it were, ahead of time, what God intends to do, what is going to happen. And, and so, uh, it, 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 again, it tells us that God, in his foreknowledge, knows everything ahead of time that is going to happen. This is not going to happen for another six to seven years. But when it does happen, it, it, again, God has already told Ezekiel, this is what is coming on the city of Jerusalem. Of course, Bible prophecy is a wonderful thing, isn't it? God, God who knows the future before it happens. He's outside of time. He knows the beginning and the ending. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And so he's telling them, this is what is going to happen. And it's good to realize that that world events, everything that happened, it's all under his control. Everything is working towards his ultimate purpose and goals. God is still on the throne. And I think this is very, very significant for us to understand. Now, the Chaldeans... Um, we're going to learn would be the angel, the the agents of divine judgment, but they are going to be constrained by angelic powers to accomplish God's will. Now, again, this is something that we find somewhat uh, difficult, perhaps, but there's no question that angels are somehow assigned to nations and territories and have influence on them. How do we know that? Let's just go back to uh, the book of Daniel. Um, let's go to, to Daniel chapter 10 just for a second. And we're going to see these angelic hosts that have roles in the affairs of nations. And so in, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, um, it says... Um, well, and let's just back up a bit. Um, verse 11, uh, it says, He said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. By the way, what an encouragement to have an angel uh, sent from God to touch uh, Daniel and tell him, you're greatly beloved of God. <laughs> Wouldn't that be an encouragement to, to get an angelic messenger telling you you're beloved of God? By the way, you don't need an angelic messenger. You have the word of God that tells you that God loves you. <laughs> That's even better, isn't it? We have the we have a more sure word of prophecy. God's word tells us we're loved of God. And, and so then he goes on, he says, They said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. God, not only is Daniel a man greatly beloved, he's a man whose prayers are heard. I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand. Look down in verse 20. It says, Then said he, Knowest thou therefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. And so when we think about principalities and powers, uh, princes over palities, over regions, over countries, over nations. So there, there are clearly angelic beings that have responsibilities for certain nations. Uh, we know for sure, for instance, that Michael, the archangel, is assigned to Israel. He's probably the hardest working angel on the planet <laughs> because if ever there was a tough assignment, it's Israel because the whole world hates them, And but he's assigned to them. But basically, I just want you to see this angelic connection because it's significant when we get to chapter 9. So let's begin reading in chapter 9, just with that background. So he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near even every man with his destroying weapon, weapon in his hand. So notice that, first of all, he cried in my ears with a loud voice. Who's doing the crying in Ezekiel's ears with a loud voice? Well, I think we go back to chapter 8, verse 2, and it's the one that was seated on the chariot throne 
Uh, then I beheld and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. He put forth the form of his hand and took me. And so it's clearly the same person that has taken him in spirit. Remember we said that it was a pre-incarnate Christ that transported him from uh, where he was in the banks of the Kibar into Jerusalem, to the temple, to see these things. And so this voice that he's hearing, this loud voice that he's hearing, is coming from none other than the eternal Son of God, the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, this loud voice, why is he speaking with a loud voice? Well, firstly, we might say this. First of all, it's an it's a, it's a natural expression of the fierceness of, of the divine indignation and wrath. Remember verse 18, I will deal in fury, mine I shall not spare, neither shall I pity. So it's emphasizing the fierceness of the divine indignation and wrath. But also, um, it's a voice that is not going to have anybody interrupting or anybody interfering with it, such as the loudness of the voice. Also, it's just ironic that verse 18 of chapter 8, we we just had this statement that though they cry, these sun worshippers, these women worshipping Tammuz, these, all of these abominations, when they cry in my ear with a loud voice, yeah, well, I'll not hear them. And so they can cry with a loud voice, not going to have any effect, but now he is crying with a loud voice responding to their cry with a loud voice. He is crying with a loud voice, and it's a loud voice calling for judgment. And so he causes them that have charge over the city to draw near. So who are these? Uh, the, the word charge over the city means they're ones who are specially appointed to attend to, to, uh, to uh, watch over. Uh, and th the common consensus, I believe this too, is that they are angelic beings who had responsibility to watch over the city. Each one of them had a destroying weapon in his hand, a slaughter weapon in his hand. And so we're going to see, verse 2, it says, Behold, six men came. Now, again, let's not get concerned here. Angels are often described as men probably because of their appearance when they're seen by men. So let's just uh, verify that. Let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 19, where we'll see quite clearly that angelic beings, when they appear, often appear as men when they are appearing before men. And so we have this scripture in chapter 19, verse 1. It says, There came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So what he's saying, seeing his angels. But verse 5, it says, They called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? So the men of Sodom see these two angelic visitors and how do they describe them where are the men which came to thee this night bring them out to us that we may know them and then notice again in verse 10 but the men put forth their hand and pulled lot into the house to them and shut the door and they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness so again they're called men there verse 12 and the men said to lot hast thou here any besides Son-in-law and thy sons, thy daughters, whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. So again, all we're simply saying is uh, that it's not uncommon to have angels appear as men and described as men in Scripture. We just saw that in Genesis 19. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 tells us they're ministering spirits, and part of their ministry is to those who are the heirs of salvation. And so... Also described as watchers uh, and and holy ones. Daniel four thirteen, uh, in Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he uh, in his dream saw God's commands carried out by a watcher and a holy one. So different ways they're described. So anyway, these men, angelic beings, 
He says, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. So um, they're, they're coming from the north. Again, this, this gate by the altar in the north. Uh, very significant because ultimately the Babylonian judgment, when it comes, is going to come from the north. These men symbolically are showing the judgment that's about to come. And um, it's certainly there's going to be the north. is a, a, The whirlwind coming from the north, this judgment God is bringing, is going to come upon them. There, it seems, and uh, there's some debate about this, but most believe, and I believe with them, that there were six men with slaughter weapons, and then there was a seventh man, the one clothed in white linen with writing materials at his side. So he, he's the dress, the equipment, and the instructions he receives show him to be perhaps the leader of the other six men. And so it talks about this one, uh, clothed with linen with a writer's ink on. Now, linen was the fabric used for the dress of priests. Uh, we know, for instance, Ezekiel 28, when high priestly garments are described in verse 39, it talks about the, the, the first garment the priest has on is all made of white linen. Uh, also, angelic beings, uh, back again in Daniel chapter 10, and verse 5, they often appear, as it were, dressed in white linen. And so, in Daniel 10, in verse uh, 5, it says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. And so he sees this linen-clad individual Chapter 12, verse 6 and 7 of Daniel. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which came, was upon the waters of the river. And he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that lives forever and ever. It shall be for a time, times and a half time, so on and so forth. So again, all we've just seen is that uh, priests wore linen garments, angelic beings, wore linen garments. This um, angelic ex ex executioners uh, came from the way of the upper gate. And so it, it tells us th their direction. Uh, it says, uh, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. So this, this gate, um, we, we know a little bit about it. It was built by Jotham. Um, and uh, we, we see this, for instance, uh, again, Second Kings tells us about the construction of this gate, and it's one of the later gates that is constructed in the uh, the house of God. Second Kings fifteen, verse thirty five. And it tells us this. It says, Howbeit the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. And then it says, He built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. This is speaking of King Jotham. Uh, Jeremiah 20, verse 2 calls it the new gate because it's the most latest one to be built. And um, toward the north of the city, the direction from which we've already said the Babylonian invaders are going to come. And they're standing by the brazen altar. Again, we notice this in the description. Uh, it, it tells us um, uh, that stood beside the brazen altar, chapter 9, verse 2 of Ezekiel. So by the brazen altar, this was a central point in many ways of the true worship of Israel and of and the very fact that this whole area had been profaned, what we've seen in chapter 8, it is fitting that the instructions for the destruction of the temple and the city is given in this very location, where sacrifices were presented, where sin was atoned for. And yet these people, with such a marvelous system given by God, had so profaned the house of God that the angels receive their instructions at this particular place. 
So it tells us in verse 3, and now we're going to look at the course of the judgment that is about to come. It says, And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink on by his side. And so, again, here's the Lord's glory beginning to leave, going up from the throne, uh, you know, the, the, the mercy seat uh, where the, the cherubim were, going up from there to the threshold of the house. And the picture is this, because of the abominations that filled the house, he can't stay there anymore. So he's beginning to make his journey. And we're going to see the, the, the progression of this journey in these chapters as he keeps moving. He goes out to the, to, the, to the gate towards the east, and then he goes out to the Mount of Olives. And so we're going to see uh, how the Lord just slowly but surely abandons the house. But you almost get the picture of reluctantly. He, the, the, it's re with great reluctance because of their wickedness that he has to leave. And so we see it here in verse 4. Uh, of uh, chapter 8 verse 4 let's just look at the references of it 8 verse 4 he says behold the glory of the god of israel was there so this is in the temple according to the vision that i saw in the plain uh, we see uh, in chapter 9 it goes up from the threshold we see it again in chapter 10 and verse 4 and the glory of the lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house and the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the lord's glory and then finally, chapter 11 and verse 23, the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city, which is what we call the Mount of Olives. And so the gradual withdrawal of the glory of the God of Israel from a defiled house. For God to do this is a most serious thing for the nation of Judah. Having turned from the only true God, they were now relying on these idols, which were really deceptions. They really were figments of their own and surrounding nations' imaginations. They were going to, instead of putting their de dependence on him, they were transferring their dependence to, dependence to these worthless idols who would be unable to be of any use to them. So basically, the idea is this. they were God was handing him over to judgment. He would no longer be there for their defense, for their protection. The tragedy is that they should have learned. Uh, you look at the book of Hosea, um, the first of the minor prophets, and we find that um, Judah had seen what had happened to the northern kingdom. This is what makes it even worse, is that they... They have witnessed what, you know, God abandoning the northern kingdom to judgment. Uh, and we see in Hosea 4, verse 17, he says, um, verse 16, For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to idols. Then this little message, let him alone. That is uh, a message to Judah. Don't emulate him. Just leave him to his devices, to his judgment. And, and tragically, they didn't learn that lesson. And so uh, the God of glory calls to the man uh, clothed with the linen, which had the writer's ink on by his side. So he's given a task, this man with the writer's ink on. And what is that task? Well, verse 4 tells us the task. The law said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Search out anyone who's sighing and crying because of the abominations. Now, just a kind of aside here, the word inkhorn is peculiar in terms of scripture. It's not found, this word is not found anywhere else but this chapter. And many believe it's a loan word from Egyptian, and from the Egyptian, it refers to the scribes writing equipment, incorporating pen, ink on, wax, writing, tablet, the whole thing. And so uh, the Lord is, is allowing judgment to come. He's going to withdraw his glory. But before he does, he wants to make sure that any person 
in that city that is sighing and crying. In other words, they're mourning for what has happened. They're not happy with this. They are to receive a mark. Now, what is the significance of this mark on these men that sigh and cry? Well, it's clearly a mark of protection. Notice verse 6. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. And so the idea is this. This mark, if they had the mark on their forehead, they would be preserved from the judgment. Why? Because their heart was broken like God's heart. They sighed. They uh, cried because of these abominations. They were one with God in their in their distress at what Judah had done. And God noticed that. Second Timothy 2.19 says this, the Lord knows them that are his. And so uh, it was the last rem remnant, really, in a society uh, which had given themselves over to the abomination of idolatry. And here there's just a few that are to be marked with the, the ink horn, to mark all that sigh and all that cry for the abominations done in the midst of the city. Of course, that, that mark symbol comes from Genesis 4.15. Remember Cain, uh, and of course, uh, uh, he felt that wherever he goes, somebody's going to kill him, and God put a mark on Cain. And the idea was that it would be a protection. He wouldn't be killed. It goes back to Genesis 4.15. Um, these men who sigh, now it's interesting that there are going to be men who sigh and cry further on in the book. And I just want to look at a couple of references. Ezekiel 21 verse 6 and 7, it says, Sigh therefore, thou son of man, is Ezekiel, uh, with the breaking of thy loins and with bitterness, sigh before their eyes. It shall be when they say unto thee, Wherefore sighest thou that thou shalt answer for the tidings, because it cometh, and every heart shall melt, and all hands shall be feeble, every spirit shall faint, all knees shall be weak as water. Behold, it comes and shall be brought to pass saith the Lord. Of course, the tidings that come, come from Jerusalem, that Jerusalem has finally fallen. And so his sigh will resurface there. Broken heart, intense grief because of the, the desolation of Jerusalem. And of course, uh, you see it again in chapter 24 and verse 17, it, where he's told at the death of his wife, he says, forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire of thine head upon thee, put on thy shoes upon thy feet, cover not thy lips, eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and even my wife died, and I did, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. So he's told there not to cry um, because uh, of the death of his wife, uh, because uh, again, that the people there. Uh, wouldn't have time to mourn the desolation of Jerusalem because they're just going to be completely uh, destroyed and taken into captivity. So what we could say, again, practically here, and we do need to make this practic practical, is there not a time for us to mourn? When we see unrighteousness uh, dominate our nation, uh, should it not cause us to mourn? Uh, we don't we don't hear much about mourning. It's it's not a popular thing, sighing and crying. And yet it's interesting. The Lord says, Blessed are they that mourn, Matthew 5, verse 4, for they shall be comforted. But when there was great immorality in the assembly in Corinth, uh, sadly, they didn't mourn, and he rebukes them for that. He tells them that's what should have occurred. Verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 5, he says, You're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. And so there is a place uh, when we see such departure, uh, we see such wickedness uh, amongst God's people, there is a place for mourning. How deeply are we moved by rejection of God's word in our culture. How deeply do we mourn for these things? God knows those that do, and he takes note of them. 
Uh, in fact, uh, we've we talked about this remnant uh, even during the days of Ahab and Jezebel. As wicked as Israel was, the Lord paid attention. He said, "I know the seven thousand here that have not bowed the knee." And so, isn't it interesting how God does pay attention in the tribulation period? There's going to be a uh, some marking again, isn't there? Uh, there's going to be the mark of preservation put on the 144,000. They're going to be sealed. They're going to be marked. And uh, they will be uh, preserved during uh, that uh, time of great judgment and wickedness that's going to come on the earth. Uh, let's just read again. We've not that long ago studied this book together. But in chapter 7 and verse 3 and 4, we read these words. It says, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our gods, God, in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. Then were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the, the tribes of the children of Israel. So th this sealing. Now, here's just a little aside. Um, and it's kind of a little gem, really. But um, yeah. the Hebrew word for mark um, is... Um, is actually a Hebrew letter, and it's the letter T or Tau, T-A-U, uh, which at the time was written as a cross. Uh, without being superstitious, uh, we can see almost an anticipation uh, of salvation through the death of Christ. So they would have had this mark, and it would have been the, the Tau, which was, uh, again, in ancient Hebrew, would have been like a cross. That's what I'm told. I'm no expert. And uh, maybe uh, Angelo can correct us on that afterwards. But anyway, um, <clears throat> interesting too. Remember we talked about Satan being a counterfeiter. He is also going to have a mark that people will take. And of course, he's the he's going to become the the world dictator. And it will be sold as you take this mark of loyalty and you will be preserved. You won't, you'll be able to buy and sell. You'll be able to do all these things, and you're going to be preserved. Again, Satan, the counterfeiter. But tragically, those that take that mark, instead of being immune from judgment, are going to be eternally doomed. It's a very serious thing to buy into Satan's counterfeit. And so, again, they take a mark, and it would be... Uh, a sparing from judgment. But we want to notice um, the severity of the judgment that is coming uh, on Jerusalem and beginning in, in his sanctuary. Uh, it, it says, uh, again, uh, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Uh, and then it says, um, uh, verse 5, and to the others, he said, in mine hearing. So this is to the other angelic messengers. Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. And so they're going to go and they're going to, with their slaughter weapons in their hands. And again, remember, this is symbolic of what the Babylonians are going to do. Six to seven years later, they're going to do this work. But the angelic uh, messengers are basically in symbols showing what's coming. And notice it says, slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children, women, come not near any man upon whom the, is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Judgment must first begin at the house of God. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. So the severity of the judgment, the scope of the judgment, no distinction, male and female, old and young, all equally guilty, all of them would indeed bear the judgment. Now, I want to just, uh, uh, in, in the remaining minute we have, I just want to finish with one scripture, Second Chronicles, and this is the historic fulfillment of this. Uh, we'll have to wrap up next time, but I want to just do this historic fulfillment. Second Chronicles 36, verse 17. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young men or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hands 
and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, all the treasure of the house of the Lord, the treasure of the king and of the princes, all he brought to Babylon, and they burnt the house of God, so on and so forth. So this is the historic fulfillment that will take place uh, concerning these things that are seen in symbol here in chapter 9. And so that ends our hour. May God bless these thoughts to us. Amen.